One of the central themes of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus is about the contrast between who we once were and how we used to live back then compared to who we are now and how we should be living now. One of the ways he phrases this is found in Ephesians 5 and 8 where he says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Most of Paul's letter to the Ephesian church is actually filled with instructions on how to actually live this out. Over the years, you know, we've talked about all kinds of things related to who we are in Christ and why we are here. What our purpose is, both individually and collectively. What our unity in Christ is supposed to look like according to God. We've even talked about how unity doesn't actually mean in agreement with, as most of us think of it. It means joined together as one. And in fact, Jesus' prayer for us is that we would be one the way he and the Father are one. So that's a whole other level. So biblically speaking, our unity isn't just about believing the same things about God or getting along. It is much, much, much bigger than that. We've talked through how as the church we are God's family and we learn how to be a family by being together as a family. We talked about how as the church we are also the bride of Christ, which is a very, very special relationship. We're reminded that as in a marriage, although you're still married when you're not at home, if you spend most of your time out of the home, you're not going to have much of a marriage, right? We've talked about how as disciples of Christ, we need each other in order to mature in our faith. And we unpacked a little bit about our call to holiness. Another way we say that is Christ-likeness. It's about the transformation that occurs in us that makes us more and more each day, hopefully, like Christ. And we've also talked about how clear the Bible is about our need for the fellowship, the accountability, and the loving correction of the body, as well as the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in order to get there. Today, we're going to look at a passage from Ephesians 4, where the Apostle Paul writes this. It says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's a passage I come back to all the time. In fact, I, I fit this in, weave this into so many different messages. It's not funny because I believe that there is such a great foundation for our lives found right here in these words. As I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, through the Apostle Paul, the Lord has urged us to live a life of light. And this passage from Ephesians 4 unpacks a little bit of what that's supposed to look like. And as familiar as this passage is to many of you, and especially considering how many times I've brought it up over the last few years, I think it's important for us to talk about the three things that Paul says we are to do to live our lives for Jesus, found here in this passage. The first is this. We are to live a life worthy of the calling that we've received. And right away as we get into this, I want everybody to notice that each of these things that Paul unpacks a little bit, everything in this passage is active. Right? It's about actually doing something. It's not merely about ideas, the way we think about things. It's also not merely about feelings, good or bad. It's not about what we feel about stuff. It is about rising up. It's action. It's about living. For those of you that don't know this about me, though, I talk about it all the time, so I'm sure you have an inkling. Uh, In case you haven't heard, I love movies. Huh? Right? I do a series every summer at the movies because it's fun. 
Anyway, I love them, and, and uh, I've loved them all my life ever since I was a little, little kid. I'm the guy who would much rather watch a movie than read the book, and for all the book readers out there, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. I know there's more information in the book than you're ever going to get in a movie. I've read tons of books that were made into movies. We're on the same page, but I'm just the guy who would much rather curl up on the couch with his family and watch the movie in two hours than go and sit in a room by myself reading a book, right? I just enjoy them. Anyway, throughout my years, because I've watched a ton of movies, I have heard a line of dialogue that keeps popping up uh, all the time. I've heard it in all kinds of films, said in a variety of different ways, but basically it's the same thing. I've even seen it on TV shows. And I would venture to guess, because of how much I've heard it, you've probably heard the same statement made. It's something that goes pretty much like this. Well, he's alive, but I wouldn't exactly call it living. You ever heard that before? Right, so, yeah, most of the room's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. I think that line gets used so often because I think we all kind of just recognize that there is a big difference between being alive and really living. The Bible suggests that this is also true about our spiritual lives. Perhaps even more so than our temporal lives. Because the Bible says some very challenging things about the life lived for Jesus. And if we're living the kind of life where the stuff in here and the stuff in here doesn't actually match the stuff out here in our lives, well, then we might be in real trouble. The Apostle James warns us in James 2.19, he says, You say you have faith because you believe that there's one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. Listen, I'm going to be the first one to tell you that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've done. Hear this. It doesn't matter what you've done. The past really is the past. It doesn't matter what you have done. Even if it was an hour ago, Jesus loves you, period. Jesus loves you deeply. Jesus died for you. And he is offering you the gift of of salvation if you'll place your faith in him. It does not matter what you have done, but it does matter what you do. It matters what you do with that. Salvation is based on faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ, but faith is more than just the things we think and the things that we feel. Faith is about what we do, isn't it? I mean, what you really believe. This is kind of like, I should make a bumper sticker out of this. What you really believe, you will act upon. Good and bad. Faith is something that is lived. Faith is something that is alive and it's active in a very real way. Faith is what you are. Remember, this life in Christ is about the life lived for Jesus. It's about being more than what we used to be. It's about living as children of light. It's in the character that you display every day. It's in the priorities that you you set for yourself and your life. It's in the the attitudes that you hold. It's, It's in the words that come out of your mouth. It's in all that you do, all of the time, everywhere you go. Because a life lived in Christ is not something that you add to yourself. It is who you become. Does that make sense? We often treat the moment a person says yes to Jesus like they finally burst through the tape at the finish line, but the truth is more akin to when the starter pistol is fired at the beginning of the race, because when we come to know Jesus, that's when life really begins, isn't it? God wants you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. He wants you to be a beacon for his kingdom, to shine his light into the darkness of this world. He wants you to have a life that is exceedingly, abundantly more. He wants you to live in the power and the beauty of the Holy Spirit for his glory and for his kingdom. He wants you set apart from this world. He wants you to be different. He wants you to be his to be holy, right? We know this. Living a life in a way that is worthy of, call, of the calling that we've received takes intention, it takes energy, it takes effort. It's something we do on purpose. 
This is probably my soapbox thing for my life, right? This is another thing I weave into most messages. Being intentional about how we're living for Jesus. Showing kindness to someone when the other person is being a jerk really is quite hard sometimes, isn't it? Think about it. You ever worked retail? (whistles) Better know Jesus, I'm just saying. (laughs) See, the life lived in Christ doesn't happen on autopilot per se. It takes the, the exercising of grace and mercy and love, sometimes in the most challenging of circumstances. Living a life worthy of the calling we receive takes training and doing as well. It takes practice. You're probably going to have to push yourself sometimes. You might even have to reprioritize your life at some point. And it might get awkward and messy. Because honestly, if we are living a life for Jesus, and we're really digging into that, it means that we're, we're going to be trying to live in ways that don't always feel the most natural to us, and that means we're going to make mistakes. Ever make a mistake? Mistakes can be messy. I hear a few no's. I'll meet you in my office after the service and we can have a prayer time together. <laughs> I don't remember how uh, I don't remember how it all started now. It was so long ago. Um, but I, I do remember the first time I had to go to one of my kids and apologize for my behavior. Um It was one of those things, uh, Crystal was probably about 11, maybe. And it was one of those moments where she was being challenging, and I was being challenging, and we were going at each other a little bit too much, and I lost my patience, and I yelled at her. And, of course, she ran away crying, went to her room, and climbed up in her bunk bed, and Tracy came to talk to me, because Tracy's always good to come and talk to me when I do stuff like that. (laughs) to show me, to make sure I could see where I had taken a wrong turn. I already had seen it, and that was just the affirmation I need. And I remember in that moment, I realized that any parenting I might have wanted to do, any, any words I may have wanted to say into Crystal, any life I may have wanted to speak into her, were lost when I lost my temper. Right? Right? They were gone. She wasn't going to receive any of that from me. And so I turned, and I went upstairs to my young daughter's bedroom, and I leaned up into her bunk bed, and I called her over. And I told her I was wrong, and I apologized to her. Very humbling moment. And I learned so much about this life and how we're supposed to live for Jesus in just having the humility to know that I was wrong. When we wound people with our words or our behavior, we lose any voice we might have had in that moment of the relationship. And in this case with Crystal, I recognized it and I went and did something about it. But living a life in a way that is worthy of the calling we received isn't something we can coast through. That's really the point of all of this, right? Accidents will happen. So we need to have the love of Jesus in our hearts, locked in, and then live from that place on purpose. Or apologies don't happen. The work that the Holy Spirit does in us is done in partnership with us, right? Remember what my friend Jeff was talking about just a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about that partnership between us and God. right? God doesn't wave a magic wand and transform you like that. He gives you opportunities to express It gives you opportunities to live the kingdom in this world, in the mess of this life. Transformation isn't a magic spell on anybody. Transformation occurs as we walk in agreement with the Lord and are regenerated by his spirit. Transformation occurs as we're obedient to him. So here's a couple things we can do. If you're reading your Bible and you read something that challenges you, pause and ask God about that. Maybe there's something there that you need to start applying to your life, or maybe there's something there that you need to stop doing in your life. It happens to me all the time. I'll see something and I'll realize, oh man, I do that. And then I need to pray. Right? It's like what James says in, in James 1 and 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Another thing we can do is find yourself a, a small group. September's quickly approaching, and groups that have been taking a break over the summer are going to be kicking back in. We may even have a, a few new ones starting up. We all need those close, personal, intimate relationships in the body, in our church family, because it's out of those close, personal relationships in the body, in this church family, that we find the encouragement, the accountability for our spiritual growth. Unity doesn't just mean agreement with, right? It means joined together as one. So if you're not cultivating close, personal relationships in your church family... That would be a really great place to start. I want to encourage you to be praying and considering what it means to live a life worthy of the calling that you have all received. Because this passage is just a great place to start. There's so much more. We're good? Let's keep going. Okay? Since we're talking about really living the life that is worthy of the calling we received, it's worth noting that something else that Paul says here is that we are to do this by... Being completely humble and gentle, by being patient, bearing with one another in love. So let's pause here just for a second. Let me ask a question. Now I want you to really think about this. Try and imagine this, if you will. Can you imagine what this church would be like if everyone was living like this? Just this right here. All the time, in every moment, everywhere. Now, can you imagine what our community would be like if everyone was living this way, all the time, everywhere we went? How about the world? What would happen to the world if everyone lived like this all the time? Because this is the bullseye. This is what we're aimed at. Isn't it? This is what God wants. And I don't know about you, but when I picture that in my mind, even when I just let my thoughts drift in that, meditate on that idea alone, my heart feels so big in my chest, it feels like my ribs are going to break. Why do you think it's so important for us to be humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love? Because I think it has something to do with our attitude. (laughs) We talked about this a little bit last week, in fact, right? In Ephesians 4, 22-24, Paul says this. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. I'm going to stop just for one second. I want to add a thought. This is just something to meditate on because I was thinking about it this morning, so I'm going to do it to you too. <laughs> right? Can I just say, just as a side note at this point, that part of what this means is that if you are a disciple of Jesus and there are parts of your life that still look the way they did before you knew him, that might be something you need to visit with him. Okay? Pretty simple. Let me, let, me, let me back up. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's just like we talked about last week where Paul said in Philippians 2, 5, and 8, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I wonder sometimes how often I'm confronted with a situation and my first thought is about me. And I don't even notice it. You ever thought that? Ever wondered? You ever thought about, you know, how often do I get into a situation and I'm the first thing I think about? Right? Like a knee-jerk reaction. Because I'll bet it happens a lot. Like, I don't know. But I, I think about these things sometimes. Like, how often am I a thing and my concern is really about me? Just like we talked about last week, the kingdom of God 
is always about placing others above yourself. Sometimes I think that, that we as Christians get this confused sometimes. I know I mentioned this last week, but for those who may not have been here or, or missed when I said it, the, the very best working definition of humility I've ever come across is what C.S. Lewis said. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. He said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's about prioritizing the needs and the wants of others over your own. Remember Philippians 2 and 3, Paul said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, consider others better than yourself. Humility is about living in such a way to make other people more important. To elevate them. To lift them up. Gentleness... Well, gentleness is very difficult to convey when we're motivated by a selfish ambition, right? Because we're going to be concerned with ourselves. Gentleness requires a person to be intensely aware of how they're presenting themselves to others. It's the demonstration of kindness and, and tenderness, which are both birthed by compassion, by the way, regardless of the circumstances, no matter what's going on. So to be awful hard to be gentle if we weren't also humble. Do you know what patience actually is? Right? Talks about patience. Do we actually know what patience is? I know we're, we're. I know we're. Most of us are pretty good at losing it. I am, right? But do we know what it actually is? It is the practice. Now hear this. Patience is the practice or the action of considering others more important than you, more valuable than you. Right? Because when do I get patient? Right? When I want something a certain way and it's not happening because of somebody else. It's about considering a person over their behavior. It's about assuming the very best of people in the worst of their circumstances. You understand, it's not about approving poor behavior. Proving, approving of, of things that we know are not good. It's about allowing people to be broken and imperfect, approving of the person despite how their behavior makes us feel. Patience isn't required when the other person is behaving in a way that makes us feel good. It's only going to be required or even noticed when they're doing something that's rubbing us the wrong way. Yes? Yes? Now, please understand, I'm saying this while I'm looking into the faces of people that I know demonstrate all of these things. I see it all the time. I watch it happen. You are a people that I would lift up to others and say, here is an example that you should look at if you want to see what this looks like in action. Time and time and time again. I rave about you when I go other places. In a couple of weeks, I'm doing a pulpit swap with Pastor Brent in Asbury, and I'm going to go over there. I'm going to tell them about you. And I'm like, you guys are pretty great, but you're not as great. No, I may not do it like that. <laughs> that might not be so good. <laughs> I start talking, I just completely lose my place. It's awesome. I know you to be people who bear with one another in love a whole lot of the time. And I want you to know that I see all of that about you. But here's the thing, because there's a thing. The Greek word that's been translated completely here is the word pas, P-A-S. And the word pas quite literally means all, whole, every single bit, totally, entirely, completely. It's absolute in its connotation. Paul is saying here that we are to live a life worthy of the calling we've received by being humble and gentle and patient and bearing with one another in love all the time, in every way, with no exceptions. <laughs> That's big, right? This isn't something we're supposed to do. That's what that means. This isn't something that we're supposed to like, oh yeah, i got to remember to do that. This is not something we're meant to do. This isn't something we're meant to be. Right? This is what God's trying to transform us into. That we're going to become this. That this would eventually become our autopilot. All the time, everywhere, in every situation. It's huge, right? And I want you to know, because a few of you are going, I do that too when I think about it. You aren't able to do all of this. He is. 
And if we stay open and we hold our daddy's hand and he says, go this way, we say, yeah. He says, go this way, okay. Say this to them, okay, right? I like that booming sound that keeps coming out. It's really not distracting at all. Are you pressing in with your journey with Jesus? Are you opening yourself up to living his way? Are you putting what you read in his word into practice in your life? Do you you get up and try again when you fall? You know, there's an exercise that might be helpful for you when you come upon a characteristic of Jesus, when you see something in Jesus in, in the word, where you believe you have room for some improvement, like considering others above yourself, for instance, Every morning for one week, try this. When you wake up, take a few minutes to pray for the work of the Spirit in that area of your life. Just that. It's very simple. Just pray that the Spirit would do a work in that specific area in your life, and then begin your day. If you're anything like me, when I put a discipline like that into practice, I find myself much more aware of the people around me. As I go through the day, I I start seeing opportunities to demonstrate this to others. I start finding myself actually feeling different about challenging situations because I am seeing the people differently than I once was. Remember, the work of the Holy Spirit is done in concert with us. Transformation occurs as we are obedient to the Lord, as we walk in agreement with Him. So start your day by focusing on on walking with him in the work he's doing in you. Okay? One more thing. Last thing. Paul says that we are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I believe that, at least in part, this is a reminder for all of us that the outcome is not our responsibility. How things turn out in the end, that's not our responsibility. That's not on us. What is on us is our obedience to him. Does that make sense? We're to make every effort, do our very best. Excellence. I I say this all the time to, to leaders as we're doing training together. I said, we are not, I'm not asking you to be perfect right now. I'm asking you to give your very best. Whatever that may be. The outcome is not your responsibility. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but I feel like I I need to keep plugging that. The outcome, in the end, what comes of all of it is not your responsibility. What you're responsible for is what you put into each situation. You can't control what other people do. You have no power over the forces at play in the world. He does. All you can do is do your best with what you've been given in every situation and trust God for everything else. You can have the very, very best equipment in the world all the bait in the world. Use every skill at your disposal. Spend an entire day in a boat in the lake and still not catch a fish. Right? Because some things are beyond your control. <laughs> some things there are more things go- sometimes there are more things going on than what you're aware of. The outcome's not your responsibility, it's his. You are simply responsible to do your very best best with what you've been given by him in every situation. It's a sentiment that's actually echoed all through the scriptures. It's like what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 18, I think it is. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We're to make every effort in every situation all the time to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And what that means is that we are to do everything that is within our power and we're to leave everything else up to Him. 
As I mentioned just a moment ago, you have all the best equipment and the, all the bait in the world, do everything perfectly and still not catch a fish. So the point here is very simple. Are you willing to give God your best? I don't, I don't just mean try. I mean just give him everything you got. Are you willing to give God your very best And are you willing to trust him with all the rest? That would work as a bumper sticker, right? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and I'm going to just pray for us for a moment. Incidentally, if um, after the service is over, I'm going to come up to the front. Um, I've been asked by uh, one or two people uh, for prayer today already, and I just... uh, I just want to be available. If you have something on your heart that uh, you'd like prayer for, um, I'll be up here and be happy to pray for you afterwards. Heavenly Father, um, I know sometimes even in my own life, I, I get inside my own head and I make things much more complicated than what you have made them. I pray for all of us, Father, today that... You would obviously continue to lead us and guide us in all of this. But, Father, that as we enter in with you, as we walk with you, as we look for your way to follow your path, to live in your will, Father, I pray that you would help us just to open up and pour out our very best in every situation. And equal to that, Lord, I pray, I pray mightily, Lord, for all of us, that you would help us with our faith in those moments to trust you with everything else. Sometimes we put too much on ourselves. Sometimes we put things on ourselves that you've declared are not for us. And so, Father, we repent of that and we look to you. And I just pray in this moment for each and every soul here, Lord, that as we go and we, and we put, our, put our heart and soul into all of this, Father, that you would bless us in that place. Meet us there, I pray that you would help us to give our very best and then to trust you with all the rest. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ.